Welcome everyone today to the Observing and Modeling Climate Variability in the Inter-America's Seas and Impacts on the Continental Americas and the Caribbean, um, a virtual workshop. And this is Kristen Uhlenbrock from the U.S. Cliver Project Office. Um, and if you see multiple emails from me communicating, uh, myself and Joel Reisdorf will helping kind of run this meeting today. So if you have any questions, you can feel free to email any of us on the side as the meeting is going on. Uh, before we get started, I'd like to go over a few housekeeping items. First, if you have any technical difficulties here on this first slide, uh, you can see the ReadyTalk number. Please make sure you have this available and you can call them at any time. They're going to help you much more quickly than Jill and I will and walk through anything. You can also get online and chat with them at ReadyTalk.com. We have two oral sessions today. The first one starts now at 1 o'clock and will last until 2.30. And then we'll break for one hour and host the virtual poster session. We'll return at 3.30 this afternoon Eastern Daylight Time for the second session and the second set of talks. The workshop will wrap up at 5 p.m. today. And if you go to www.uscliver.org, you'll be able to see the link for the full workshop agenda as well as the posters on the home page. During the poster session this afternoon between 2.30 and 3.30, we encourage you to view the posters and to ask questions and post comments for the authors to respond to. The presenters will be online during this hour and actively engaging in any of the questions that you pose to them. Just so you know, we'll be recording this workshop and we'll make an archived version available online shortly after everything is over. Everyone is currently on mute and you'll remain on mute during the presentations. Each presenter will have 15 minutes along with five minutes for Q&A. There will be two ways for you to ask questions. One way is to type in your question in the chat feature that you can see in the upper left-hand corner of the screen. We'll be monitoring these questions and queuing them up for the speakers. You can ask questions in the chat feature anytime during the presentation. The second option is for you to raise your hand by clicking on the button in the middle of the screen that says raise hand. During the Q&A, we'll alternate between questions that come in from the chat function as well as those of you who raise your hand. When you raise your hand, we will we'll take you off mute, so you need to make sure you have your audio connected, and let you know that you can then ask a question. Please remember to keep your question succinct and to the point. When you're done, we'll put you back on mute. So after the 20 minutes are allotted for the speaker, we'll move on to the next speaker. If you have any questions that did not get asked for that first speaker or the second speaker, please go ahead and make sure you type those in the chat box for us. We're going to go ahead and collect all those speakers that are in the chat box and pass them along to the presenter, and then they'll be able to answer those after the workshop is over, and we'll email those questions and answers back to the entire group. So now I'd like to go ahead and introduce Germán Poveda. He's from the National University of Columbia, and he'll be chairing the first session, and he'll introduce the speakers. Germán, go ahead. Thank you, Kristen. Uh, good morning, or good afternoon, everyone. This is Germán Poveda. I'm a professor at the National University of Columbia in Medellín, Colombia. It's an honor for me uh, to be chairing this first session of this very interesting workshop on identifying opportunities and challenges of observing and modeling the Inter-America Seas variability and its teleconnections. Uh, we have four speakers in this session. <clears throat> Each speaker is given 15 minutes, and at the end of the 13 minutes, there will be a reminder bell for the speaker. We will then have five minutes for questions and answers. Our first, first speaker is Professor Edward Zipzer, the University of Utah, who will be talking on mesoscale convective systems in the Inter-America Seas, evidence from TRIM. Our second speaker is Dr. Nina Joseph Mani of the University of California, Los Angeles, who will be talking on predictability of Eastern Pacific intraseasonal variability. Our third speaker is Dr. Brand Mapes of the University of Miami, who will be talking on the Inter-America Seas summer weather and its shaping by the atmosphere zonal mean momentum. And our final speaker is Dr. Ernesto Munoz from the National Center for Atmospheric Research, who will be talking on advancing the understanding of the Inter-America Seas with the Community Earth System Model. So now I would like to welcome Dr. Zipser to start the presentations. Dr. Zipser, please. <clears throat> yes, thank you very much. Uh, do I click on my 
slide yes. four here. Yes, go ahead and get started, and you should be able to navigate slide four. Perfect. Okay, and here's my buttons. Okay. Um, well, this is a, a new experience for me, and I appreciate the invitation. And um, I will first uh, want to hasten to add that almost everything that I'm going to talk about is using the TRIM precipitation feature database. TRIM, as you know, has been a very successful satellite with a 16, 17-year history, and so many people at NASA and the field programs need credit for this that I am not going to even try to give acknowledgments except for one case, which is Dr. Chantao Liu, who was with me in Utah for many years, who is now a professor at Texas A&M Corpus Christi, um, sort of bordering on the inter-American seas. And he is responsible for the trim precipitation feature database. Everything that I'm going to talk about is from this database, and it is open to everybody that wants to use it. Uh, a lot of it is very intuitive, but if you have questions uh, later on or after at any time, you can contact me or uh, Chun Chao Liu. Uh, okay. Uh, so what is a precipitation feature? Very simply, we define a feature as contiguous precipitation area on the trim precipitation radar. How do we define a mesoscale convective system? That is, uh, uh, Bob Howes used to define it as anything that's 100 kilometers linear dimension. We define it very loosely as something about 2,000 kilometers square in area. In other words, much bigger than an individual convective cell or convective storm. Um, we have used this database to, to answer and ask a lot of interesting questions. Uh, for example, uh, one of the things that, that we are interested in knowing is where in the world does most of the annual rainfall or seasonal rainfall come from large systems like MCSs? Uh, where does most rain come from light rates, from heavy rates? Uh, what fraction of the rainfall over land and ocean comes from thunderstorms? Uh, I can answer that, and it may surprise you a little bit. And where are the strongest convective storms on Earth? Uh, now, this is just a map of annual rainfall uh, from one of the trim radar algorithms, and it's something that you've probably seen many times before. Uh, the rectangle is a rectangle I'm going to use many times, and I apologize, it's about five degrees too far north. Uh, every other rectangle you'll see will be in the proper zero to 25 degree uh, latitude belt. Uh, and the only thing that I'm putting up this, this very large 14-year average of annual rainfall from, from trim it's just simply as a reminder, which probably nobody in this audience really needs, that the heaviest rainfall in the Inter-American Seas region is either on land uh, or in the intertropical conversion zones in the Atlantic and, and Pacific. Uh, now, here is a little bit of a, com it may look complex, but it's actually a remarkably uh, informative uh, picture. We asked the question, where in the world do we have the most of the rain coming from very large precip features, greater than 8,000 kilometers square? And on the bottom, where in the world do we have most of the rain coming from smaller features, sub-MCS scale? Starting with this bottom one, uh, and here's the correct located box that I'm going to use later for the Inter-American Seas, uh, where does most of the rain fall from small systems? Well, the entire trade wind belt. So here we have the trade wind belt starting in Africa, extending into the Caribbean, and if you can see this, extending all the way to the Central American coast. And then, of course, it starts again in the Pacific, and here's Hawaii right about here. 
So the trade wind belts and Hawaii has most of the rain falling from small weather systems, sub-MCS in scale. Top is answers the question, where, do, where does most of the rain fall from large systems? And there we come to the intertropical conversion zones on both sides of South America and a little bit in, in northwestern uh, South America, the place on Earth with the greatest fraction of the rain coming from very large systems is actually the subtropics of Argentina where we have these monster mesoscale convective systems. Okay, moving on. Uh, here's answering some similar questions, and uh, like I say I'll be zeroing in on the Inter-American Seas in a minute. Uh, we might want to ask where is most of the rain coming from precip features that are reaching 12 or 15 kilometers, well on top reaching 12 kilometers. Now that's not particularly high in the tropics, but one of the things you'll notice, and the, you have to look at the bottom for the scale, the reds are 60, 70, 80 percent of the precip in, in, or on land in Central America and and for and land in Africa uh, does come from systems that have a maximum height of 12 kilometers for the radar echo. But if we if we make this a little tougher question and say where, how much of the rain comes from systems that reach the tropical tropopause at 15 kilometers, very very little in the Inter-American Seas region, less than 20 percent. Uh, anywhere it comes from rain systems where the radar echo reaches the tropical tropopause. It's much higher fraction in Africa, and we've known for a long time, thanks to TRIM, that African systems are stronger and taller and more robust than the systems in South America, and I don't think anybody has adequately explained that yet. This is one of my favorites on the bottom. The uh, what fraction of the rainfall comes from systems with at least one lightning flash as uh, detected by the trim lightning sensor. And the entire tropical oceans are down in the less than 10% category. And I'm sure that some of us remember when we heard that the tropical oceans, Joanne Simpson said, are the firebox of the atmosphere. And the popular conception is tropical oceans have thunderstorms. Well, they don't have a whole lot of them. Uh, over land, uh, you can see this. quite a lot of the rain comes from thunderstorms. Okay, now zeroing in more on the inter-American seas. Uh, this is the, uh, by season, the rainfall from one of the trim algorithms, the radar algorithms. Uh, and, and as I'll show you in a minute, and I think everybody knows, each of the trim algorithms gives you a slightly different answer for rainfall. Uh, however, in, in uh, this is June, July, August, fall, winter, spring in the Northern Hemisphere, the, this famous rainfall max on the Colombian coast shows up as a max in every one of the four seasons. And, uh, uh, and so I don't want to dwell on this figure for a very long time, but I do want to make sure to, that you all recognize that, uh, sorry, this is now an uh, exploded diagram of just one season, September, October, November, and this is again the radar algorithm. The main point I want to make here is that uh, there are important but relatively subtle differences between the trim algorithms. So this is the, rain, this is the radar algorithm, and you can see that uh, here on the Colombian coast, uh, we're approaching a meter a month uh, if you go through the math here. However, uh, let's go to the, let's toggle back and forth between the radar algorithm and the passive microwave algorithm and I'll just go back and forth a little bit. And you can see radar, passive microwave, radar, passive microwave. 
passive microwave, for reasons that nobody completely understands, gives you a thinks that it rains more heavily in the oceanic intertropical conversion zone, whereas the precip algorithm uh, says that it rains a little more often in the heavier rain regions on land. Uh, again, this is just a little bit of a caution that you can't take any one of the trim radar algorithms uh, completely, uh, completely uh, literally. Uh, that's passive microwave. Okay, and now again for the Inter-American Seas region, uh, very simple question, what fraction of the precip comes from mesoscale convective systems? And the answer very simply is considerably less than 50% over the trade wind belt, considerably over 50% over especially the Pacific Coast and the Pacific ITCZ. We don't go far enough east here to pick up the Atlantic ITCZ. Uh, now, I'm, for the remainder of the talk, I'm going to uh, try to answer one simple question, uh, or rather make one simple point, which is all convective systems are not alike. And going to the Zuluaga and Howe's paper for June, July, August, uh, as a good example, uh, the, they, define, they define deep convective cores as any convective core where 40 dBZ echo extends up to 10 kilometers. This might not seem terribly deep, but it's quite deep to have a 40 dBZ core, which implies grapple particles uh, at, at, at 10 kilometers. And you can see that there are essentially no such deep convective cores over the tropical ocean in either the Atlantic or Pacific. If we say wide convective cores, which is 40 dBZ extending over 1,000 kilometers squared, uh, again, the Sahel outranks uh, anything in the inter-American seas. If we go to where are the broad stratiform regions, then now Finally, the tropical oceans show up, and some of the wetter portions of the continents show up as having a, a, a considerable amount of the rain coming from, from those kinds of systems. Now, for the last set of slides, I'm simply going to uh, ask very simple questions, and it's very easy to answer these questions by going to the trim precip feature database, putting in the lat longitude limits, as I have here for the IAS region, and, and putting in various limits on what type of system uh, we want. So this is an answer to the question, where are the individual precip features with the most volumetric rain, that is greater than 300,000 of these units, which basically says five millimeters an hour uh, for 60,000 kilometers square area. And you can see that the oceans dominate this. Uh, and, and my guess, and that's more than a guess, I've checked this into it, these features up here in the trade wind region are mostly tropical cyclones or hurricanes. Uh, so in with that exception, the tropical oceans uh, uh, the trade wind regions don't have this type of huge amount of precip uh, features. The, the different colors, by the way, are the, uh, the really greatest rain volumes are in red, the next biggest are in blue, the next biggest are in green. Different question, where do we find the strongest rain rates at the surface on the pixel scale? Where is there more than 50 or 100 millimeters an hour rainfall rate on the trim pixel scale of about five by five kilometers? Now we see both land and ocean represented. That's a different question. Where do we have the highest lightning rates? And now the oceans disappear pretty much, and we have this very active region uh, over northwestern Colombia and, and stretching to Lake Maracaibo, which is a well-known hotspot for 
uh, really intense convection. Here we're talking about greater than 100 flashes a minute. A slightly different question, uh, where do we have the very highest 20 dBZ radar echoes greater than 16 and a half kilometers? Well, there's some of them over the ocean, but again, the very same region of northwestern Colombia and occasional areas on land. And I think this is the last one. Uh, where do we have deep convective cores? Uh, that is, echo tops, 40 dBZ echo tops exceeding 10 kilometers. Well, now we don't have a thousand, so uh, everything is in black. Uh, cross marks, and now, uh, you know, for those of you that understand the way deep convection is organized, we see quite a few over the large islands, land areas, all the way up and down uh, from about Guatemala north through Mexico, but interestingly enough, almost none in Panama, Costa Rica, and Nicaragua. Uh, and they're just scattered over the Amazon. So the Amazon, as compared to uh, compared to Africa, has much less severe convection. And the basic lesson here is that all convective systems are not alike. They are extremely different, and it's worthwhile recognizing there's a big difference between convective systems with really heavy rain rates and convective systems with really intense updrafts, hail, lightning, and, and tropopause penetrating convection. And thank you very much. Great. Thank you, Dr. Zipser. Um, at this time, we'll take any questions. So if you have a question, feel free to either raise your hand or type them in the chat box. Kristen, can yes, I take German. a question? Yes, okay. please go ahead. Thank you, Dr. Zitzer. Wonderful presentation. Uh, I have a, this last transparency is very, very interesting for me because it shows very clearly how different is the interaction between land and atmosphere from the interaction between ocean and atmosphere. Do you have a comment about that and the importance of that dif of those differences in 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 or associated with different mesoscale convective systems or deep deep cores uh, to, to point out the importance on, of land-atmosphere interaction versus uh, ocean-atmosphere interaction? Well, we've been looking at this for uh, as long as, as uh, longer in fact than, than TRIM has been launched. And, and, uh, and I think that even today, although less than in the past years, we see a lot of misconceptions. It used to be that people who wrote papers about deep convection would say, as you can see, the most intense convection is over this area when all they're showing you is the coldest IR tops. And, and, and it, it's become really obvious that it is quite important to distinguish between deep clouds over the ocean, which do produce a lot of rain, and very intense convection. In fact, the difference is, is uh, probably a factor of four or five or even 10 in updrafts. The, we've learned a long time ago that updrafts over tropical oceans tend to be five meters per second or less for most part, and you can't really get a severe storm with a five meter per second updraft. At any rate, uh, there's, uh, all you have to do is Google the papers that Chantal and I have written over the last uh, Twenty uh, last 15 years, and you can get a lot of this information. Mm -hmm. Great. Thank Looks you. like and we have. A, yeah, go oh, ahead, uh, Jermon. We also have a question from Vasu. So go ahead if you want, and then we'll go to Vasu. Um. No, just just uh, some words about the importance of the diurnal cycle in the in this uh, dynamics. Yes, the. Um, uh, the, it's very easy to go into the web page for any region on Earth and get the diurnal cycle of any type of convective system you want. Uh, uh, some, we've written some papers on this. Chun Tao has taken the lead on this, and, and there's absolutely no question about it. Uh, uh, in, in general, I think you mostly know this, that the uh, uh, precipitation maxima over most of the oceans 
is night and early morning and over land with a few notable exceptions in the mid to late afternoon. Mm -hmm. Okay. Thank you. Great. Thanks, Sherman. Um I'm going to go ahead and take Vasu Mizra off mute. Vasu, um, go ahead and ask your question. Ed, thank you for this wonderful talk. Uh, I was just wondering if you have investigated this midsummer drought phenomenon with your data set. You know, I wanted to do that, and and uh, we do have the easy capability of looking at any particular time period. Uh, uh, but I didn't really have time to go into that in 15 minutes. But it's something that would be relatively easy to do. Uh, why don't you uh, either email or offline? Uh, let us know what types of, of questions you'd like to ask or, or in particular, uh, how would you like to define the time period of the midsummer drought and is it the same in every year, et cetera, et cetera. All right. Sure. Thanks a lot. Great. Thanks, Vasu. Uh, one more question and then we'll go to the next presenter. Uh, Paul Drummeyer uh, chatted in the question, uh, how can these statistics be re reliably continued in the post-trim era? Oh, well, the, uh, the Global Precip Mission uh, uh, core satellite's been launched, and, and uh, I think if you simply go search for GPM, Global Precip Mission, there's already a number of papers out uh, describing the Global Precip Mission core satellite and, and the other satellites that uh, that are a part of the mission that basically give uh, three-hour estimates of passive microwave uh, rainfall uh, all over the globe, up to 65 north and south. The sampling of the core satellite over the tropics is a little less frequent than it was with TRIM because it uh, has to cover more of the planet. Uh, but uh, the Global Precip mission in both the core satellite and the uh, and the uh, uh, collaborating satellites uh, is doing a pretty good job. Great. Thank you. Okay. Uh, we're going to move on to our next presenter. Uh, Nina, can you test your audio and let us know if it's working? Hello. Can you hear me? We can hear you. You're a little bit quiet, so maybe you can uh, just talk loudly. Okay. Yeah. And your slides are up. And uh, remember, if you want the green pointer, um, you yeah. can select that to use. Yeah. And you can advance your slides. And you're up. Go ahead. Thank you. Um, hello, everyone. Uh, good morning. Uh, uh, I'm Nina Mani. Today I'll talk about the predictability of Eastern Pacific interseasonal variability. And uh, this work has uh, been published in the Journal of Climate last year. You can see the uh, citation here. So uh, the Eastern Pacific warm pool, uh, what we show here, uh, is a regional strong interseasonal variability during boreal summer. And outside the Indo-Pacific warm pool, it is the region where there is the strongest influence of MGU on the precipitation variability. And the dominant mode of Eastern Pacific variability has uh, got a periodicity of 30 to 50 days, or what we call the 40-day mode. So we have the lab composites of precipitation anomalies, and you can see the eastward and northward propagation of precipitation, interseasonal precipitation anomalies from day zero to day 21. So there is like uh, northward as well as eastward propagation over the Eastern Pacific Warm Pool region. And in addition to this, uh, eastward propagating 40-day mode, uh, the Eastern Pacific Warm Pool has also a quasi biweekly mode. Uh, the high frequency mode also exhibits northward as well as eastward propagation. But since the dominant northward propagation uh, character of the Eastern Pacific interseasonal variability, uh, makes us uh, suspect that it is a local expression of the global angio mode with uh, the convective anomalies over the Eastern Pacific warm pool uh, initiated by propagation of convective signals from the Western Pacific to the Eastern Pacific process decline. So, but modeling studies show otherwise that even in GCMs which produce a reasonably good simulation of the Eastern Pacific uh, interseasonal variability, this propagation from Eastern Pacific, uh, Western Pacific to Eastern Pacific is not very evident. And most of the propagating signals are originating over the Central Pacific. So uh, it may be possible that it is also a more local mode driven by the local convection circulation feedback. 
But one thing is very evident in several studies which investigated the intraseasonal variability over the Eastern Pacific is that there is a seesaw of a collision between the uh, Western and Eastern Pacific convective activity. That is, they have an opposite phase locking. Convection phase over the Western Pacific is associated with active phase, uh, subsidence phase over the Eastern Pacific and vice versa. So this seesaw pattern of convective activity uh, leaders believe there must be some remotely uh, linked mechanism between these two uh, variability over these two regions. So there have been some studies investigating this uh, relationship, either through uh, some studies pointed like it could be due to fast propagating dry Kelvin waves, which over, as a response to the convection over the Western Pacific, which is actually causing the uh, convection initiation over the Eastern Pacific. But uh, it, how much of the variability of the Eastern Pacific interseasonal variability is attributed to this such remote forcing mechanism and how much is attributed to the local generation is not actually well understood. Now to look at the, uh, the impact of the Eastern Pacific interseasonal variability, even though it is a regional local mode, it has got broad impacts over the region's climate weather and climate ranging from tropical cyclone activity over the Gulf of Mexico and the Eastern Pacific, Caribbean Sea uh, low-level winds, gap winds, and it is also known to influence the summer uh, drought over the Central America and affects the Caribbean precipitation, North American monsoon, and it goes to the climate scale, and it has got impacts over the El Nino development. So this being the case, how well does the model simulate the Eastern Pacific intraseasonal variability. So one of the first studies that uh, used to examine the intraseasonal variability over the Eastern Pacific was for the Synod 3 GCM, which showed that most of the GCMs underestimated the variance of intraseasonal power over the Eastern Pacific. And later in the Synod 5 GCM, or it was found that only seven out of the 16 Synod 5 GCMs could capture the spatial pattern of the leading Eastern Pacific ISV mode, and even in those cases, the biases were quite high. So, but, uh, and one the fidelity in representing the Eastern Pacific ISV was closely associated with how well uh, the model simulated the realistic summer mean circulation over the region. But uh, so far, nobody has addressed how, how the models predict the mode, that is, the prediction skill and the predictability associated with the Eastern Pacific ISV. So, using the Clivar ISVHE experiment uh, data set, uh, we are looking at the predictability and prediction skill of the Eastern Pacific Interseasonal Variability. So the ISVHE is a first of its kind, multi-institutional coordinated handcuffed experiment supported by APCC, NOAA, Clivar, and NGO Task Force. And so these all these institutions around the globe came together to produce handcuffs of about 45 days and more like ensemble handcuffs, which were used to study the predictability of uh, MGO, the borrowed summer monsoon interseasonal oscillation, and also the Eastern Pacific interseasonal variability. And now I will show you the results for the Eastern Pacific interseasonal variability prediction and prediction skill and predictability. Now to first derive the Prediction skill for the Eastern Pacific interseasonal variability. We derived the mode using multivariate year of analysis of filter precipitation and wind anomalies over the Wampole region. So these are the two year of modes, multivariate year of modes, year of one and year of two. And so what we did is we projected the handcuffs anomalies onto the observed year of modes to get the PCs. And from the handcuffs PCs, uh, for each day of forecast, uh, we estimate the correlation of the handcuffed species and the observed species. So that's uh, how we estimate the prediction skill. So that these are the estimates of prediction skill for PC1 and this is for PC2. So the solid lines are the prediction skill associated for the ensemble mean and the dashed lines are the average prediction skill. You can see the prediction skill for PC1 is in the range from 7 days to 15 days. And for PC2, most of the models, it's less than seven days, only ECMWF is showing the highest prediction scale of, of close to 12, 15 days. So, now we look at how the, whether the prediction scale is different for the opposite cases of convection over the Eastern Pacific bomb pool, that is convective phase or the subsidence phase. 
So the convective and subsequent phases were identified uh, mm -hmm. based on the PC amplitude, and then uh, the handcuffs initiated during those days were grouped together, and the estimates of prediction skill and predictability were made. So out of the eight models, all of these are couple models, and out of the eight models, higher prediction skill of about three to five days difference was found in four models for higher prediction skill associated with a uh, convective uh, handcuffs initiated from the convective phase of Eastern Pacific ISP as compared to the subsidence phases. But uh, the other four models does not show the sensitivity. Now, we look at the relationship between the Eastern Pacific ISP and the MGO using the the, hunter, the PCs, which is derived using the multivariate EOF, EOF analysis over the Eastern Pacific bomb pool and the RMM indices for the MGO. So to, to show you how, how the uh, connective phase of uh, Eastern Pacific ISV is phase locked with the MGO phase uh, of connective activity over the Western Pacific warm pool. Here we have uh, derived the probability of occurrence of MGO, MGO in the eight RMM phases as when the Eastern Pacific ISV is in the subsidence phase and as when the Eastern Pacific ISV in the convective phase. So here you can see when the Eastern Pacific ISV is in the convective phase, the the RMM phases of the MGO are mostly in phases four, five, or six, and when it, when it is in the convective phase, the phases uh, phase relationship is the most of the uh, about 80 percentage of the MGO cases are in phase eight, one, and two. So it shows that the opposite phase locking of MGO convective activity over the Western Pacific and the Eastern Pacific, and we look at the relationship between the MGO amplitude and the Eastern Pacific ISP amplitude. Uh, and here we have uh, derived the probability distribution of this specific ISP amplitude. Uh, with respect to the MGO amplitude, the blue uh, corresponds to the strong MGO cases with two thresholds defined. And these are based on the IMM indices, and these are based on the OMI indices by Kilari et al. So we, we check the two indices to make sure that this relationship is robust. So, and the blue is um, for the strong MGO cases and the red is for the weak MGO cases. So here you can see that the, for the weak MGO cases, the Eastern Pacific ISV amplitude is skewed more to the left, that is to the lower amplitude. That is the, MGO, uh, the Eastern Pacific ISV amplitude associated with weak MGO is kind of weaker in amplitude. So this is again brought out in this flag composite or uh, phase composite plot for the Eastern Pacific. So this as shown here are the composite of the Eastern Pacific intrasectional variability. Uh, in precipitation and zonal events for the eight uh, phases of Eastern Pacific ISP identified. And here you can see that for the this is for the weak MGO case and this is for the strong MGO case. And for the weak MGO case, you can see that the convective population of convective signals from the western to the Eastern Pacific is weak. And also the amplitude of the Eastern Pacific intersectional variability is just weak and it kind of appears as a more local mode. And this connection between the Eastern and the Western Pacific signal is also absent. So looking at this impact, whether such a thing is present in the model, that is the NGO am amplitude impacting the signal of the Eastern Pacific intraseasonal variability, we divided the handcuffs into active NGO cases and weak NGO cases at the time of handcuffs initiation. So but, uh, and we checked whether the MGO prediction skill is different for these two groups. So out of the eight models, four models show a significantly different prediction skill estimate for when the MGO is active and from the MGO is B. So when the stronger MGO cases are associated with higher prediction skill and weaker MGO amplitude is associated with a smaller prediction skill in four, four models, so it may be possible that the MGO forcing in these models is much more stronger than the local feedback. And uh, the Eastern Pacific ISP is more driven by the MGO in these models. Now uh, we'll get the estimates of predictability. That is, uh, what, are the, what is the theoretical limit of predictability for the Eastern Pacific intraseasonal variability? So since we have the ensemble handcuffs, we, use, we treat them as like identical twin experiments first for estimating the theoretical limit of predictability for the uh, for the Eastern Pacific ISP. We use two approaches. One is called the single member approach when 
we uh, derive the ensemble divergence between two ensemble members, and uh, the trajectory divergence for the ensemble mean with respect to any other ensemble member is defined as the ensemble mean predictability. So as and when these, uh, this, and, uh, these divergence of trajectories reach as big as the signal of the string specific intersectional variability, we can derive the, derive the predictability of the mode. So here are the estimates of the single number approach and the ensemble mean approach for estimating the predictability. So this is for PC1 for the eight models and PC2. PC On average, the PC1 predictability is in the 15 to 23 days range, and the PC2 predictability is about 9 to 17 days. And when we compare the prediction skill and predictability estimates uh, put together, we can, uh, should I stop? No, you have two more minutes. Go ahead. Okay. Um, so uh, we have the single, uh, single the average prediction skill for the Eastern Pacific ISC is found to be about 10 days. And what the ensemble mean prediction skill is not that much higher. It improves by only about two days with an average prediction skill about 12 days. And the predictability is about 15 to 20, 23 days for the single member approach. And for the ensemble mean approach, it is about 20 to 30 days. So there is much scope for improvement for the Eastern Pacific interseasonal variability prediction. And to summarize, uh, we have looked at the prediction skill and predictability of the Eastern Pacific ISV in the ISVHD experiment. So based on like ensemble uh, and uh, individual ensemble numbers, the predictability is about 15 to 20 days, but the ensemble mean has a predictability of about 20 to 30 days. And slightly higher prediction scale is associated when uh, the Eastern Pacific ISP is in the convective phase as compo uh, compared to that in the subsidence phase. And also some models show sensitivity whether the hand cards are initiated when the MGO is active over the Western Pacific or weak over the Western Pacific. And relative roles of MG forcing and other forcing remote forcing mechanisms in the Western Pacific and the local feedback mechanisms in initiating and sustaining the Eastern Pacific ISP is still not clear. So exploring such mechanisms would be very relevant for the Eastern Pacific ISV simulation and prediction. So I think uh, with that, I will wind up. Thank you. Great. Thank you. Jermon, do you have any questions? I see one person has their hand up, but feel free to go ahead. Uh, thank you, Nina. I have a question. Perhaps it's my ignorance, but uh, for the clarity of your presentation, what you refer to the subsiding mode and the convective mode of the of the oscillation, you're talking about the the same thing as the easterly or westerly phase of the uh, intrasitional oscillation over the Americas, for instance? Sorry, I didn't really follow it. Uh, can I, I'm going to repeat my question. Yeah, yeah. When you talk about the subsiding and the convective uh, phase of the MGO, yeah. you're uh, talking about the easterly and the westerly phase of the modern Julian oscillation or the intraseasonal variability oscillation? Uh, uh, actually, I was uh, looking at the convective and subsidence phase of the Eastern Pacific intraseasonal variability, which we identified based on the local mode that is the year mode over that region only. So it, it, may, it may not be linked to the MGO phases actually, but uh, it will be linked to the uh, easterly and westerly phases of winds over the, the region. Mm -hmm. And the second question I have is, uh, you show in one year of your slide, you show that the ECMWF model has the highest skill, right? Yeah. yeah. Any any feeling of uh, what, what's in, the, in this type of model that, that is able to have a larger skill? Uh, the ECMWF model is generally better performing for all the phases of intraseasonal variability for the MGO as well as for the boreal summer as well as for the Eastern Pacific. The one model which uh, 
better perform, especially for the it's specific for the SMU couple model, which showed on almost as good skill as the ECMWF as the ECMWF model. So for the ECMWF model, uh, I'm not sure. Uh, it may be that both the better model physics as well as better data assimilation methods they use may be the reason that they give good good skill for the uh, for the IC focus. Okay, Nina. Thank you for your answers. Thank you. No more questions from me. Great. Thanks, Sherman. Uh, we do have a question from Ernesto Munez, um, one of the other co-presenters. He asked, in the Jiang et al. 2012 article, which one is CESM and CCSM? Uh, the CESM is a community or system model. Uh, and uh, the CESM, I think I have to check which one. Yeah. Ernesto, you're off mute. Did that answer your question? Yes, I, I can uh, No. No. Hi. Hi. Nina? Yeah. Can you hear me, Nina? Yes, yes. Well, basically my question is on slide 27 of the whole package, uh, you have a plot. Uh, and I was wondering if among those models you include CCSM or CESM. They yes. Um, so I'm interested in, 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 in that plot and your results from Yang 2012. Do you include GCSM in that plot? Uh, actually, I'm not sure about that. Uh, I will check Maybe it's the red square. Yeah, GCSM3? Right it's hard to see. It's, well, hard, any, it's hard to hear you too, Nina. Please speak up. Yeah, it's not clear in the slide right now. I'll check and I'll let you know later. Oh, okay. Okay. Yeah. Good. Thank you. Thank you. Great. Um, Diego, I see your hand raised. This is Kristen Uhlenbrock. Um, If you dialed in with a separate phone line, if you can send us that number, we'll take you off mute. But as of right now, I can't take you off mute because I don't see an audio connected for you. So please type in your qu chat question for us or send us the phone number. We'll do that. And while we're waiting, we do have a question from Eric Maloney. Um, Eric, you are off mute, and you can ask Nina your question. Hi, Eric. Eric, we don't hear you, so maybe you have your side on mute as well. Okay. All righty. Um, I don't hear Eric. Uh, if there's any other questions, um, go ahead and type those in the chat box and we'll pass them off uh, to Nina after the presentation. And in the interim, we're going to go on to our next presenter, um, Dr. Brian Mace. Uh, Hi, Brian. Hi. That sounded like the the uh, voice opener. Yes. Can you hear me? Go ahead. We can hear you. Go ahead. You're up. Okay, good. Well, um, thanks again to the people who set up this uh, interesting concept of a online uh, meeting. I'm, I'm quite, uh, quite enjoying the concept. Uh, I'm here to tell you about um, really some work by uh, Patrick Kelly and myself. Um, uh, some of it a few years ago, but uh, we've been following up a bit on it, and it's, uh, it's um, kind of in the uh, in the spirit of how global influences uh, uh, affect a region. And uh, so let's see, how do I move ahead? All right, good. Uh, so here's, uh, here's a brief outline of what I mean to tell you uh, about. Uh, first of all, this uh, barotropic mean momentum. I'm going to advocate for that being a meaningful uh, climate entity and not just a statistic. Uh, and for that being important distinction in the in the game of statistical climatology, um, the the seasonal work about the uh, midsummer drying is uh, uh, I'll just briefly review Patrick's work on that a couple of years ago, and uh, we've been pursuing it a little bit further uh, with some interannual regressions, but uh, the the issue is that it's uh, it's correlated with ENSO, and so you have to do these sort of multiple regressions to tease that apart. And I just want to show you a few uh, first uh, r results triggered by this meeting uh, about, uh, about that. So let's see. First off, just what is this uh, curly multiple bracketed thing? Um, 
the, the square brackets are a zonal mean, which is traditional um, star and Lorenz notation. Many of you have gotten that in your classes. And when you take a zonal average, it makes the uh, pressure gradient force term vanish on the right-hand side. So the zonal mean is more tractable than the local momentum because local momentum just redistributes it uh, in the east-west direction, but the zonal mean can't be affected by that. And uh, stars, in this case, are deviations from the zonal mean in, the, in, the, in that traditional notation. Uh, likewise, when you take a vertical mean over mass, uh, take the barotropic part, uh, the, the Coriolis term, which is also big in the momentum equation everywhere all the time, uh, also vanishes in that integral. And so the barotropic zonal mean momentum is, um, is uh, m much more tractable than any kind of local uh, momentum uh, quantity. And it is a function of latitude and time only. Uh, and if you further integrate over latitude, it's related to the atmospheric angular momentum and length of day, which can be measured by satellites and, and so on. So it has, uh, has those connections and, uh, to measurements. I guess uh, what I'm getting at here is that um, I think this is a very meaningful form of averaging in that uh, when you average in this way, you, you obtain a quantity with very few terms on its right-hand side. And uh, therefore, I want to argue that it's really a physical quantity that's more substantive than, than merely a local momentum, uh, more like an entity, more like a player, uh, more like a subsystem of the climate uh, whose influence we can talk about more uh, sensibly. And uh, you know, arguably, I guess, to, well, to make an argument, uh, more fundamental than uh, kind of a uh, statistic that might be more like just uh, area inside an isotherm or area inside of an isotax, something like that. Uh, and then uh, the, the price of that, of course, is that this average quantity, um, uh, we have to treat it like a wind that advects scalars, but of course advection is really always the local wind uh, doing the advection, uh, of which the zonal mean, vertical mean, is just one component. So, um, so that's, the, that's the price of obtaining a meaningful integral is um, that then you uh, have to unpack it. It's just one component of the actual local effect. Uh, the climatology of this quantity kind of defines, I think of it as defining the, the meteorological tropics, um, uh, which uh, vary seasonally. And in particular, the, um, in July, the uh, tropical easterlies extend really all the way up to 30 north in ways that, uh, that, I, that I think we've made the case are uh, uh, crucial to this midsummer uh, drying phenomenon in the intra-American seas region. There's a comparable thing in February in the southern hemisphere that uh, also makes a little midsummer uh, dryness in uh, in uh, southeast Brazil. But um, I won't review that too much, except to just show you the final cartoon, which is that this midsummer um, drying in the Atlantic can be traced to um, the anticyclone on a basin scale, which is in turn is um, advected by the zonal mean momentum, which in turn is driven by this. Um, tilted uh, northwest corner of the Tibetan High, which in turn is driven by the uh, Asian monsoon. And it sounds like a long, shaggy dog tail, but I think in these uh, papers here, including a real model uh, clincher of an experiment, I think we've uh, established pretty well that this uh, chain of causality uh, really does exist and really does, it is um, a major part of the um, mid midsummer drought explanation. Uh, from a global perspective. Of course, there's local, uh, interesting local influences too, like the upstream and downstream sides of the Central America are, are very different and, and may go against the regional pattern and so on. Uh, so we got, this got us thinking if this quantity, uh, the barotropic mean momentum, kind of shapes, uh, shapes the underside of the um, Atlantic subtropical high, uh, wouldn't it do the same thing in the Pacific, for instance? And, and, in it, and wouldn't it therefore um, have some interesting influence on the uh, steering of tropical cyclones, which are the white lines in this diagram, for instance, as well as just sort of a mean rain, rainfall? So that got us digging a little bit, uh, probably naively, just uh, as though we were the first into uh, tropical cyclone uh, uh, data. And this is from IB Tracks, International Best Tracks data set. And this is just the uh, tropical cyclone days per month climatology here through the months by longitude. And here's the Western Pacific, of course, and, um, and here's the Atlantic and, and Eastern Pacific uh, tropical cyclones. And uh, if we just uh, leap ahead a little bit and say, let's just uh, regress the cyclone days per month 
onto uh, this barotropic zonal mean momentum in a 15 to 30 north belt, kind of a, a subtropical northern edge of, uh, of the meteorological tropics, as I spoke of them, uh, and do it on a broad enough um, grid here, 30 by 15 degrees, to, um, to just, uh, just get the most significant effects. You'd say that, uh, wow, subtropical westerlies are, have a big negative association with Atlantic and uh, East Pacific. Uh, you know, inter American seas, uh, tropical cyclones. So that's uh, that's an intriguing result. But um, uh, the trouble is that this quantity, um, the subtropical zonal mean momentum, uh, is highly correlated with uh, with El Nino. And uh, so you know, here's a scatter plot of that, and uh, shows you that um, we'd better be careful about it, attributing things to uh, to our pet quantity which are really aspects of El Nino. And so when you're, when you're going to need to sort of tease that apart. Uh, and so uh, the sense of it is that the, the El Nino, the way you can remember the El Nino effect on this uh, zonal mean momentum is that a, a cooler equator here leads to a weaker subtropical jet just by thermal wind kind of uh, sense. And, uh, and then you have to remember that the barotropic part goes like the upper level part. But furthermore, for that matter, the uh, shear also goes like the barotropic part or like the upper part. So, um, so that's the way to sort of remember the uh, sense of the El Nino effect. So now we need, to attribute, uh, we need to attribute our tropical cyclones really to two factors separately. And uh, in the plain old regression on this, wh whose result I already showed you, of course, we're just uh, we're postulating that uh, tropical cyclone density ha has a coefficient times the uh, times this quantity plus some error in that relationship, and we optimize the coefficient by minimizing the squared error. So that's a single factor attribution, and you could do the same with um, you know someone who thinks El, El Nino is the, is the one and only signal could uh, cast the problem in this way, optimize their coefficient uh, by minimizing that error. And, uh, and when you do that, you get these two uh, maps. This one I've already shown you. This is the, simply the, the coefficient of a single regression on the barotropic zonal mean momentum. And uh, here is the uh, regression on Nino 3.4 only. And these are, um, you know, you could talk all day about the fact that they're uh, related or non-orthogonal or something. But the, you could say they both, uh, each, each single explanation uh, involves a comparable amount of, of the variance being explained. But uh, really, what, you, uh, what we'd rather do, I suppose, is, is make an attribution to two factors, a joint or partial regression. And so we're really postulating um, a relationship of this form, that the tropical cyclones are related one part to SST, uh, Nino 3.4, one part to this barotropic momentum. And then the error of this relationship can be minimized here uh, to give you really both coefficients separately, and if you like, you can if you like a partial derivative notation here, um, kind of Jacobian notation. Uh, you can think that this C of U comma T is really the, the partial derivative of tropical cyclone density with respect to uh, momentum uh, here uh, for a fixed value of uh, Nino three four SST. So when we do that, when I show you uh, these two coefficients here, this is the partial regression coefficient on, on Nino 3.4 only, and this is the partial regression coefficient, this uh, Cu comma T, on uh, zonal mean momentum only. You see a different picture and, and perhaps more, uh, more interpretable. Uh, the El Nino um, Pacific centered SST anomalies have a positive association with uh, with uh, tropical cyclones in the Western Pacific, as is uh, as is well known, and uh, now at this point, the uh, dependence of tropical cyclone days on um, zonal mean momentum is uh, just clearly negative all around the world, and uh, so in a way, that's heartening. That if we're talking about a zonal mean quantity, it should sort of have the same effect on on every longitude if you take away some longitude specific uh, factors like uh, like El Nino. So, so I guess uh, back to the question that motivated all this, if we were thinking that this uh, barotropic momentum uh, shape, shapes the anticyclones, 
on their subtropical southern, you know, uh, equator root edges, um, might we see these uh, tropical cyclone steering impacts? So we were in a way looking for um, dipoles, uh, east-west dipoles, and um, we don't really see east-west dipoles. It's more that um, subtropical westerlies are just bad for tropical cyclones everywhere uh, for a given value of uh, Nino 3.4. So we played this game with some other predict and fields, some other uh, kind of impact fields. And uh, if we went for just simply um, CMAP um, monthly rain here, or you know, season, uh, cyclone season rainfall, and if we just did the single regression, you'd just see uh, almost exactly the same pattern, whether you ascribe it in a single way to Nino 3.4 or ascribe it in a single way to the zonal mean momentum. So that's just a hopelessly entangled kind of a, a uh, signal there. But when you do this multiple regression, uh, you, you, again, it teases apart really some very separate uh, influences that uh, in a way uh, hearteningly make sense, I think. Here's a little bit of a higher resolution version of that. So this says that um, for a given zonal mean momentum, the effects of SST in the in the Pacific are kind of this Indo-Pacific uh, dipole that people have, have noticed, droughts in Indonesia and, uh, and uh, more wet in the Pacific. And again, uh, the partial effect only of this zonal mean momentum from 15 to 30 here has, a, has more of a zonally uh, extended uh, pr uh, quality to it that in fact you can kind of almost think of as um, a Hadley cell related uh, or, uh, or um, maintenance mechanism for the momentum itself. So, you, so it's a nice way to tease apart two things, I guess, uh, each of which makes more sense than either one alone. So uh, I guess uh, just to end kind of on a philosophical note, not sure where this goes exactly, but um, interpretation is always a tricky business. We understand ENSO variance so well that, um, that uh, of course, that's a player, a driver for climate variability. I think we know a lot less about the uh, uh, sources of this zonal mean momentum other than ENSO itself. And uh, in other words, they are not well understood. And uh, one aspect of it that Patrick has, uh, has uh, worked through very well is that there are monsoon-driven stationary eddy uh, momentum fluxes from one latitude belt to, the, to another. Uh, but then I suppose the monsoon and ENSO are correlated, and so we'd have to you know, be a little bit careful that, again, we don't uh, end up ascribing things to uh, we have to be careful in removing uh, effects that are already known in order to discover new effects. So I guess, uh, you know, the, the issue, the takeaway is that framing the problem is always an important and subtle issue, and um, you really need a coherent account of the phenomena and mechanisms that you're talking about, not just um, stab around with statistics and then hope to interpret the results. Uh, and a data set analysis can never really solve the question of its own framing. Uh, although there are people who try to say the more variants you explain, the better your model. But, um, but uh, then it's all about you know, what list of candidates you considered, and, uh, and again, you end up with a, you know, a framing-dependent uh, approach. So, so we're a little bit new to this. Some of you are much more experienced than me, I'm sure, about all this. But, um, but we're stabbing around. Uh, and, uh, and basically, we're trying to argue that this um, zonal mean barotropic momentum is, a, is arguably a meaningful climate entity and not, not merely a statistic. Um, it's because its budget has few terms, uh, and chief of those is these uh, eddy momentum flux uh, effects that are interesting to study. Uh, it has regional impacts in the, in the Americas sector and elsewhere, uh, partly uh, through helping shape the subtropical uh, anticyclone, the, the North, North Atlantic subtropical high. Uh, of course, it contributes as a component to any kind of ice attack, including the Caribbean low-level jet, for instance. Um, and, uh, and it discourages tropical cyclones for any given uh, state of ENSO. And uh, part of it is, the, is an ENSO signal, so uh, you know, we're trying to be careful here not to ascribe ENSO effects to, to uh, really our own thing that just happens to be correlated with ENSO. And the um, question, I guess, to leave you with, might non-ENSO parts of this include unique predictable signals uh, or valuable lessons about weather climate interaction mechanisms? And that's why we're sort of picking away at this is, um, and digging down to the second level um, is that we think there might be uh, valuable lessons in here. 
and conceivably uh, new predictable signals that haven't really been uh, teased out. Uh, including the Madden-Julian oscillation has a zonal mean component to it, and it'd uh, be interesting to try and uh, see if that part of its impact comes through that. Uh, so that's all I have except for uh, some extra slides, and uh, I guess I'll, uh, I'll quit talking and see if there are any questions. Great. Thanks, Dr. Mapes. Sherman, any thoughts from you before we go to any questions from the audience? Yes, thank you, Brian. Wonderful presentation. I learned a lot of things. Thank you. I have a question. Can you go back to your slide 55, please, number 55? Right. Yeah, for me, this is a wonderful result. At least I'm, I'm very surprised about the, 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 the m tremendous meaning uh, lessons that we can learn out of this slide. Uh, does that mean that your zonal mean momentum variable can be a good predictor for tropical cyclones in the Caribbean, for instance? Um, oh, tropical cyclones? Should I go back to this, maybe? 55? Slide 55. Yeah. Okay, well, this is merely precipitation, uh, CMAP rainfall at each mm -hmm. grid point. Uh, regressed on Nino 3.4 and on the zonal mean momentum separately. And I noticed that, oops, we, I, typed, I pasted in two diff slightly different seasons here. But maybe it's even more mm -hmm. amazing they look the same. But uh, here's the result for, for the identical season. Uh, oh, that's right. Uh, yeah, okay. So I think this was, what this is saying is that if you naively took this as your one and only predictor, you'd mm -hmm. merely rediscover the El Nino effect and misattribute it. And so, uh, so I think it's better to, you know, if we're looking at an El Nino effect, we, it's better to, do, to capture that with an El Nino variable, and that one has to be careful not to capture it with something that just happens to be correlated with El Nino. Mm -hmm. Yeah, but the physics of, of your variable, the zonal mean momentum, has to do with the with the intensity of the hurricane season, for instance, during El Nino, which is reduced on the Caribbean? Um, well, uh, it's, again, again, it's hard to uh, attribute that. There, often people will say that um, the effect of El Nino is to create uh, shear through kind of a walker circulation on the Pacific to Atlantic mm -hmm. scale. And, uh, you know, there are many stories about how El Nino affects um, the Atlantic hurricane season, and I, uh, I'm not quite the expert in them, but uh, but uh, but uh, zonal mean momentum isn't necessarily the mechanism by which people think that El Nino does its effect. So, so you just have to be careful, I guess, about overinterpreting uh, mere causality. Okay. <laughs> okay. Thanks a lot. Great. Thanks, Sherman. Uh, I think we'll take a question from Chen Zai Wang. Uh, Chang Sai, you should be off mute. Can you hear me? Go ahead. Yes, we can hear you. Go uh, ahead. Okay. Hi, Brian. Yeah, hi. Oh, okay. Um, when people study impact of the wind on the tropical cyclone, normally people use water wind shear, just like you said. And here you approach is a zonal, zonal wind moment. So can you make a comment on the difference between and the relationship between the your approach and the vertical wind shear? Uh, it would be good to do that uh, quantitatively, I guess. Um, I think it is often true that, um, that changes in the barotropic momentum are often uh, vertically sheared. And so, uh, so when we're ascribing an effect to this, uh, we, it may be that the local uh, mechanism by which this quantity is felt locally might be through its shear and not merely through its uh, vertical average. So, uh, yeah. so, and we have not unpacked it uh, down to that level of detail. Oh, okay, okay. But I saw it very interesting. I, I just want when they're different and the uh, relationship between your approach and the water wind, water wind shear approach. Yeah, okay. Thank you. Great. Thanks, Chen Zai. Um, we do have a few questions that came in from the chat. The first one is from Ernesto Munez. He said, hi, Brian. What time scale does the zonal um, mean you, what, uh, sorry, what is the time scale does it include? 
Yeah, well, it, you know, if you merely look at it as a quantity, it certainly has a big, uh, you know, it's correlated with El Nino, and so it ha certainly has that interannual time scale that it inherits from its connection to El Nino. There's also a known uh, effect that the MJO uh, has a zonal mean momentum uh, signature. Um, and so when people, uh, so it has many time scales in it, I guess. And um, maybe the issue is that one might hope there are some uh, uh, kind of sub-seasonal uh, time scales that haven't been that don't have names yet. So, uh, so I think I think of it as a mixture of a bunch of uh, influences, each with different time scales, including El Nino, including the Madden Julian oscillation, but maybe including other, uh, you know, unnamed uh, sources of variability. But probably this would be uh, from Klaus Weichmann, the great uh, meteorologist at PSD, who used to study this a lot. Um, uh, it's uh, sub-seasonal time scales are, are probably where it has its influence because it's a flywheel, you know, uh, the friction time scale might be 10 days or something and so, so uh, when an event spins up some zonal mean momentum, it takes maybe 10 days for it to begin to decay. So it could be kind of an extended range uh, statistical predictor is maybe the hope, of, hope for it. Oh, Great. Uh, Brian, can I, can I add very quickly to your answer, I mean to, your, to my question? Mm -hmm. So um, the data that you use is monthly data or daily data? Uh, everything we're looking at here is uh, is multi-month mean whole kind of you know for the tropical cyclones we're looking at the entire warm season uh, just and on a very coarse grid but uh, but uh, we've looked at I've looked at it daily. Uh, okay. Okay. Got it. Yeah. Thank you. Great. Let's do two more quick questions and answer these somewhat quickly, and we'll go on to the final presentation. Uh, next question was from Vasu Misra. How do we tease out regional impacts on the zonal mean, like the meridional temperature gradient between continental North, South, northern South America and, say, IAS, the Inter-America Seas? Well, I guess, um, you know, the, po the point of a quantity like this is that, um, is that its budget um, its budget has only a few terms on the right-hand side. The, the only terms on the right-hand side are really this um, U star, V star. It's the transport of momentum in, in the latitudinal direction. And so, um, so things like the meridional temperature gradient are part of you know, how it is geostrophically balanced, but uh, I, don't, I don't think you'd quite want to think of them as impacts on it. You'd rather think of maybe they're things that it impacts in a mild way. Uh, might be the, uh, the temperature gradient that it needs to uh, from thermal wind balance. So I'd, I'd rather think of those as um, impacts of it rather than impacts on it, I guess. Great. Okay. And the final question comes from Paula Arias. Uh, some studies indicate a westward shift of NASH explained by changes of America Atlantic thermal contrast. Have you observed changes in the Indian monsoon that could help to explain such NASH shift based on the Kelly and MAPES 2011 mechanism? Well, here's an answer from Patrick, who's, uh, who's on the line downstairs, I think. Uh, but um, uh, but uh, I guess the, uh, the sense of the mechanism is that, uh, uh, let's see here. Have we observed changes? That, yeah, um, yeah. There's certainly an observational correlation between rainfall in uh, on the western, especially on the western edge of the Asian monsoon, and rainfall in uh, you know our region. So that observational correlation is certainly there. And furthermore, I guess this uh, what I called his model clincher here was to darken the soil of India in a climate model and see that um, rainfall goes down steadily. You know, the darker you make the soil here. The more there's the, the drier it is here uh, in the midsummer uh, drought. So um, I think you know that in a model uh, context, that's clearly causal because you control this and see that as an impact. And then observationally, you just say, well, they are also uh, related. So I, so I think there are there is evidence that that's a real uh, a real linkage that leads to real variability. The question is whether you now have extended predictability of this that would allow you to, to use that linkage uh, and extend it to another region. I'm not so sure about that. Great. Thank you. We're going to wrap up there. If anyone has any other questions, feel free to type those in the chat and we'll pass those off uh, to Brian. 
And for our final presentation from session one, we have Ernesto. And Ernesto, are you taking yourself off mute? Oh, well, yeah. Uh, yes, I just did. <laughs> Wonderful. <laughs> okay, you're up. Go ahead. Hello, everyone. Uh, my name is Ernesto Munoz, and I have not been uh, that active in the inter America Sea uh, research community, but nonetheless, I thought this virtual workshop was a great opportunity for me to make you aware of some products, some data sets, some model simulations that I have uh, worked on and contributed to uh, while I was at the National Center for Atmospheric Research. So I have titled this uh, talk, Advancing the Understanding of the Intramedica Sea with the Community Earth System Model. Um, that was, uh, that's the main focus of this talk. Sorry about that. And, uh, and my goal is essentially, well, to make you aware of this data sets and to give some details uh, about this data sets. So very often we rely on, on observations, and, but those have limitations. These uh, data sets are model simulations, uh, and I will mention some common things that these simulations have. Um, so why the CSM to understand the Intermedic SC? Well, CSM is one of uh, the state-of-the-art models used on the IPCC. Um, these simulations are not limited to, to a couple of decades, but they uh, cover sometimes hundreds of years, and therefore they include interannual to the K variability. And at the same time, if the IS CLIP community, the Intermedic FC research community, analyzes this data, it will contribute to the understanding of CESM in simulating the climate variability in the Intermedic FC. I think that is one aspect that not only CSM developers will be interested in, but also the community in general at the end. So I will go over three of these data sets that have already been documented uh, in publications, but I have not seen a lot of studies. I have not seen too many publications on these. Well, and, and to some extent, I mean, these are recent uh, products. So one of these is uh, a carbon climate feedback set of experiments that was um, documented recently, and it was developed in collaboration with the uh, uh, scientists at University of California, Irvine. The second one that I'm going to uh, describe very uh, briefly in, in general is um, a synoptic global couple simulation with a 10th degree ocean coupled to a quarter degree atmosphere. And the last one that you probably have heard of is the large ensemble project, the CSN large ensemble project. So I am not the PI on these projects, I was not the PI. Uh, I was just a contributor. But since I'm also uh, interested in the Intramedic SC community, I thought that, again, this was a good opportunity to make you aware of this sets of simulations that could and that uh, could easily contribute to your research. So it would be nice if, let's say, two years from now, or maybe five years from now, there is a publication uh, on intermediate gas seed topic that uses some of this data. We know it takes a little while to, for publications to uh, uh, go and, and be reviewed and so on. So that way, here we go. So some common things uh, on this um, simulations, well, the obvious is that it's CESM, only that in these the land component may be different or the atmospheric component. So that's something to pay attention to. But they are coupled simulations, meaning that uh, they are not constrained to observations. This is, there's no data simulations in the ones that I'm going to describe. And they have more than a century of data, including the high-resolution simulation that I will describe. Two of these sets have biogeochemistry. Um, in both uh, in the ocean, including. 
So the high resolution, though, does not have the biogeochemistry in the ocean. I'm sure you're well aware of the TSM, but just to give you an overview, we have the atmospheric model coupled to the ocean and other components via the coupler. So for each of these components, there is data. There is data perhaps in a slightly different grid, um, but that data is there to be analyzed. And I want to go over aspects that have to do with the climate change experiments. And we have here in the, uh, I'm using, I should use the green arrow. We have here in the atmospheric component um, the anthropogenic emissions uh, separate from the natural emissions. Uh, so that's something that is important for the carbon climate change experiments. In the ocean, um, in two of these sets, we have biogeochemistry. And these is a depiction or, or uh, a, a, a diagram of the, the aspects and the variables that are included in the ocean biogeochemistry. So when it comes to the processes that are resolved in the one that is typically used, the one degree uh, coupled simulation, we, we capture not only climate change, but also variability and you know, ENSO, but not the eddies. Now, with the 10th degree ocean, we are capturing eddies. And this is important for the intermediate can see because we have the loop current, for example, and we have this one cone rings that are detached from the loop current and travel all the way to the west. So one of the slides that I include shows circulation in the Gulf of Mexico uh, from the 10th degree ocean. So the climate carbon feedback experiments, uh, contact person is, is Keith Lindsay at NCAR. I'm including the reference here. You, you can notice it was published this year, 2015, very recent publication. And the lead author is James Randerson at Irvine. The uniqueness of this data set is that we have more than one simulation extending to the year 2300. And also that we change climate change contributors we either keep them constant or allow them to vary. And these aspects that we have allowed to, that we have either uh, kept active or inactive, they are the uh, radiative impact of the carbon dioxide. We also have anthropogenic forcings, the greenhouse gases and aerosols, um, and land use change. So, a quick uh, table describing three of these simulations. We have one, which is the typical that you see uh, with uh, radiative CO2 impact on the atmosphere and also anthropogenic forcings varying all the way to year 2300. But then we also have one experiment in which we keep um, radiative CO2 at 1850 levels and also the anthropogenic forces. And finally, we have another one in which we do not, do not include the radiative effect of CO2 or keep it at 1850 values, but allow the anthropogenic forces to change. And this graph shows results from those simulations, those three simulations and you can see the red, which is the one that we typically see in IPCC reports, only that this is a different version of the model. Um, and you can notice that it extends beyond 2100 all the way to 2300. But then we also include in this figure the one with no CO2 forcing and the one with no anthropogenic forcing and no CO2 forcing. So you can ask yourselves what are questions that you can address with these experiments that are relevant to the Inter-America Sea variability and climate variability. For example, how does ENSO affect the Inter-America Sea when there is no CO2 forcing? And there are many questions that 
I think will be interesting to address with this data set. Now, I'm going to go very quickly uh, to the next set of uh, simulation, which is, in this case, actually, I'm not going to say it's a set, but just one single simulation that um, was done with a 10th degree global ocean coupled to a quarter degree atmosphere. And again, the uniqueness here is that we have 100 years of coupled simulation with a 10 degree ocean. And this was documented in this paper in 2014, last year. The data has been available for, for some time now. But again, I have not seen too many uh, studies or, or publications or, or, or drafts on uh, using this data. And I think it's a great resource, especially for the Inter-America Sea community. So here's an example. Well, here is velocity at a depth of 55 meters in, for the Gulf of Mexico. And for each of these uh, uh, sections here, these tick marks are one degree. So in between these tick marks, there are 10, 10 data points. So there's going to be about 20 data points in the Yucatan channel, for example. And if we look at how this is resolved in the 10th degree ocean versus the 1 degree ocean, um, you can see that 10th degree has a really nice um, bathymetry. And when I look at previous maps of this flow, this simulation captures very well that Yucatan flow. And, some of, and the gray areas indicate a uh, flow that comes from the north. Uh, so in, on the other plot, we have the 1 degree Yucatan channel circulation. In this case, I'm only just doing it for two years, but you can see the big difference in the bathymetry and also the general flow. Um, so this in itself, I think, shows the great advantage of using a 10 degree ocean and also the advantage of or the potential of analyzing and capturing these processes in this region that we know has, I mean, a lot of islands and, and narrow channels. And if I take the Yucatan Channel on a monthly um, time scale, and for a number of years I correlate that Yucatan Channel to the mixed layer depth in that region by separately for each month, this is what you get. Um, the color bar here is the correlation coefficients for six months of the year. So this is basically indicating that when the Yucatan channel flow um, decreases with, when the transport, the volume transport weakens, then you get a one core ring forming. You can also notice the structure, the fine structure of the mixed layer depth in this case. We have to also uh, be careful because these are, this shelves here are very shallow but in any case, you can see the, the fine structure in, in, in the correlation of the mixed layer depth to the Yucatan channel volume transport. Now jumping to the other one, the last product I would like to uh, introduce to you and the community of the Intermedia C scientists is this one, the large ensemble product that will the publication is going to appear very soon in the in BAMS, the Bulletin of the American Meteorological Society. And I'm one of the authors. I'm probably like, I don't know, 15 in this case. Uh, I don't remember. But in any case, uh, it is part of that. I, I, you know, having been exposed to it, ha having worked with it, I think it will be great for this community to, to make use of and take advantage of because of the potential to understand processes in the in this region. So, and the uniqueness about this one is that we have more than 30 different ensemble simulations. Um, so, and they have they were they have very common things, but they differ in their initial conditions in atmospheric temperature in the year 1920. And I'm going to use this plot to describe that uh, setup. And 
the gray shade here is the ensemble spread after 1920. And you can see that it follows, uh, well, in this case, it's the RCP 8.5 scenario. And this covers, well, in this case, there, there's like a, a members 2 to 30 through 30 plotted, but I think there are a few more actually produced at the University of Toronto. And they stem from member 1, which was initialized with 1850 values from a control simulation that actually um, covers several centuries. So you can compare these simulations with the control simulation, and you can compare and extract ensemble statistics from this more than 30 ensemble set of simulations. And they differ only in their initial conditions in atmospheric temperature in the year 1920. So I think this, uh, the Intramedica C community, the ISCO community, um, is doing great work. And these are sets uh, of data that I think would contribute to the type of research question that we work with. And basically, in, or in addition to that, any um, documentation of, of uh, the understanding of these processes based on this data and these simulations will also feed back and contribute to the understanding of CESM and how well it's doing in this region. At the end, also guiding model development. So. I wanted to thank you for your time. If you have any questions, please let me know. I have also included some contact information and their references, but you're also uh, welcome to contact me with uh, questions, and, and I can even provide scripts on how to process this data. Thank you. Great. Thanks, Ernesto. Uh, German, anything from you before we go to the audience? No, uh, Kristen, just to thank uh, Ernesto for bringing this product to, to our attention. I, I think it's going to be a very useful resource for the community, IceClip community. Thanks a lot. It would be very nice if we can get in touch to see how can get uh, handled on the, on the data. Okay. Great. Thank you. Okay, so a, a, few, a few questions here queued up. Uh, Quisha Glynn wanted to know, is Saharan dust forcing included? And if not, how might it affect your results? Mm, that's a good question, Sahara and Dust. Um, so that, I think, would be under aerosols. Um, and you're asking, uh, I think, in general, uh, not for any specific set. Uh, so I think that would uh, be under aerosols. And I was with the Ocean Group in, at NCAR, not, not the... Um, the atmospheric model development group, uh, but that's something I, I will find out and get back to you. Um, now, also, I'm not showing, you know, results that I did. These are results that have already been published for the uh, carbon climate feedback experiments in the large ensemble. The only ones that I produced for this talk were the ones from the high resolution ocean. Um, so I don't, I don't think it would uh, differ too much, but I'll get back to you on that, and thanks for the question. Great, thanks. We'll take one from Diane and then one from Chen Zai. Diane uh, chatted in, what is the temporal frequency of model output for CESM with 0 0.1 degree ocean resolution? So that is a great question because also what happened in producing this, uh, this set was that we needed by, by saying we, I mean the team um, of which I ha didn't have much decision-making uh, uh, power. But in, in any case, they had to also think about storage and, and storing this data. So there is daily output of SSD, sea surface temperature, and sea surface height, and perhaps daily output of other fields that are just one level. Uh, for example, wind stress, um, and I can get back to you on that. But for the most part, this is monthly data, monthly data. But nonetheless, it is for 100 years 
at 10 degree, 10th degree resolution. So even at, that, at monthly data, I think will be uh, helpful um, because of the long period it covered or, or, or made available. Great. Uh, last question from Chen Zai. Chen Zai, you should be off mute. Go ahead. Okay. Um, for the CMAP5 model, almost the all models show code by and draw by over AS region. So here you show the high resolution couple ocean atmosphere model. Did you take a look at the model by over AS region? Um, so I, I'm trying to understand your, your question. You said uh, they all show. Um, for the other model, the for the, for the yeah. other CMAP5 model, model show the code by over oh, the oh, AS. In, and 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 drive by over the this region. Yes. So so this high resolution model. Did you take a look at the model by over AS uh, that, region? Yeah, that's a good question, Jim. So I'm going to uh, uh, repeat your question. You're you're asking about the cold bias in the uh, in the Caribbean Sea and tropical Atlantic, tropical North Atlantic. Is that correct? Yeah. Okay. So that's a good question uh, because there is a couple a uh, cold bias. And actually, that also affects the tropical cyclone development. And I want to take this opportunity and also mention that we did at quarter degree atmospheric resolution, the model resolves tropical cyclones and, and hurricanes. But unfortunately, because of the cold bias, well, let's, let's not say because, but um, there are two things that perhaps, I mean, it's up to you and us to to make sure they are related or not, but there is a cold bias and also there is a, a, a lack of tropical cyclone development. So even in those 100 years, even in those 100 years, there's not too many cyclones, not too many hurricanes. And perhaps they, these are related. I mean, we will say, yes, they are related, but perhaps there's also strong wind shear in, in, as part of the cold bias. How severe is the cold bias? I don't have the numbers right now. I don't remember, but I am going to forward you the publication. We can take a look at that, and who knows, maybe something comes out of uh, your question. Okay. Great, thanks. Um, I'm going to read the, one more comment we have from Joseph Prospero, and then we're going to go to break, so we're aware of our hour break for poster presenters. But Joseph wanted to also just leave the comment that most models that he had seen that include anthropogenic aerosols do not include dust, which is normally and perhaps improperly regarded as natural. It is important to consider how climate change would affect dust emissions since that would be an anthropogenic impact. And he also says, in the recent IPCC assessment, the models could not agree on climate trends over North America, which today are known to be major sources of dust. Ernesto, do you have a quick I, comment on that? Yeah, and I want to clarify, he wrote North Africa. Um, oh, North Africa. And, Sorry. Thank you. Yeah. <laughs> yes. And I and that's my uh, that's what I had in mind. I think um, uh, dust is not included as as aerosols, um, and I think it's included as a constant source. It, it is. It has a seasonal cycle, but it is just a, a repeating seasonal cycle. I'll I'll find out about that. And one person that I can ask very quickly is Natalie Mahowald, who has worked on, on that, and I think she is putting a lot of time and effort uh, into into dust from, from Africa. But uh, thanks for your comment, uh, Prospero. I think is is really good one. Yeah. Great. Thank you. And if you have any other questions or comments, feel free to send those in the chat. Um, thank you for joining us for session one today, everyone.